Ambitious Co-Creators, Lilu here. I'm in Sedona in studio with, I would say, one of the delicious, the most delicious men here in Sedona. Marty, hello. Hi. I'm glad that we meet again and this time in studio to do a real yeah. interview about your life story that is really, truly amazing and inspiring. Well, I love being here and I loved when you uh, came to the house and shot all the uh, art. Beautiful but I did. art. Uh, but I did for a short period of time. So that video went viral all over the internet, and we definitely, I saw a spark of your your genius and your inspiration and your love, and we're going to speak of all of that today because you wrote a few books. They're all titled "The Field of Love," right? And you have your memoirs, right? But also smaller little versions of it, or how would you call them? Well, the second book there, the one, this one, which is called "Field of Love: How to Experience the Field," sort of takes the experiences that I had in the memoir and condenses them into a, uh, a shorter book so people can sort of go right to those experiences and what my recommendations are for trying to connect with the field or the unified field of love by doing different types of exercises. How do you know there is a field of love? How would you describe um, it? Um, I, after meditating for 30, 35 years, and I was just about to move out to Sedona, and as I was just saying prior to the interview, I had, um, there's a chapter, that title in both, in two of the books, which is called, I Can't Feel My Balls. Yeah. And um, people were like, so well, that's a little outrageous to put a title in there, that, something like that. But when I was living um, in Boston, right before I moved out, I had back surgery, and I woke up on the, um, in the recovery room, yeah. And as a doctor was saying, well, how did it go? Can you feel your legs? Can you do this like that? And then all of a sudden I realized that I could not feel a certain part of my body. Oops. And I was screaming. <laughs> I was screaming. And my uh, daughter, who was 18 at the time, was, comes running into the uh, recovery room. And, uh, Dad, Dad, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So I'm much better now. It's like, fine. The feeling, How is that related yeah, to the field of love? The field Marty? of love. So what ended up <laughs> happening was when I came, I got out of the hospital, yeah. um, and uh, I was staying in my apartment, and I mean I had I needed a walker. I had to stay in the hospital for a few days. Uh -huh. I needed a walker, and they didn't they told me they didn't tell me when my the feeling was going to come back. Six months, a year, we don't we don't know what, what's going to happen, and I was completely devastated by that. So I said, well, how am I you know. Uh, living in this uh, apartment, and I thought I had done something really, really terrible to deserve uh, this event uh, you know what had happened, you know. And uh, I finally got myself to go outside in the street with my walker, and I got out in the street. When I really, when I got back to the um, the apartment door, I couldn't get it open. You know, I stood there like, oh my God, I can't get it open. And here comes a homeless person um, walking down with a bag of cans right out of Central casting garbage bag filled with cans looked like he hadn't taken a bath in a year he looked at me with such love and compassion he put it down and opened up the door for me and i went in as soon as i got into the elevator i just started crying mm. and my heart just Melted. something just um, something like just happened to me I, I i didn't understand what it was and i went upstairs and it took me maybe an hour to recover from that and the next day I went out on the balcony of this apartment building. It was July 5th, sunny, beautiful. Open Which year? What? Mm, this is 2000. Okay. This is in 2000. Fairly recent. Yeah, yeah, 15 years ago. And um, people upstairs were yelling down to me from a, complete strangers, hey, can we, can we get anything for you? Want us to go to the store for you? And it's like people, just complete strangers, wanting to help me. It's like never experienced that. Same thing again. Like, no, I'm okay. I'm fine. I'm fine. Go back in, slide the door closed. As soon as I get inside, boom. You know, I'm just crying and crying. I said, what is this? What is this? And um, this inspired me to start meditating. I have to, to figure out what's going on with me. And as I meditated, I saw this um, little two-year-old in a crib holding onto the railing mm. and having my mom come in and say, Marty, put your head down and go to sleep. Mm. And uh, I kept on seeing this vision of myself as a two-year-old. And I realized in that moment that I started to hold the belief that on some level, I wasn't lovable. Mm. And I needed to do everything myself. It was so embedded in my unconscious mind that I had held for 50 years. 
and all the meditation I've done and all the different practices and all the inquiry and everything else, nothing could hook into that, break that open, but this experience. So, uh, and it's I, interesting to know that because with the career you had and you had two multi-million dollar business that mm -hmm. you brought public and that yes. you sold and you're the successful man and put so yeah. much energy out and yet you are not lovable. Yeah, well, and not, and not the thing that's crazy is like not knowing it. Yeah. Not, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that. So I started to ask myself the question, without the thought, yeah. I'm not lovable, who am I? So uh, I just kept on, who, without that thought, who would I be? Mm. So I went out into the hallway. It was like a big apartment. I was going with the walker down the hallway, and a complete stranger gets off the elevator and starts walking towards me and uh, with a briefcase. And as he walked towards me, his body just turned into light. And the amount of love that just filled up the space completely engulfed everything in the hall, including myself. I just went against the wall, and I was just in this field of overwhelming love that was so transcendent. And I've had a, a number of really powerful Kundalini experiences and uh, everything else. This was like no efforting, no thought, no trying to move my breath, do a mantra, do anything else. The, I just went into this field that was completely transcendent. Were you, did you feel that you were touched by the hand of God? Well, I felt like I was the hand of God. Yeah. And I made it back to my apartment and I thought I was concerned that I couldn't feel my leg. Um, and, and I couldn't feel my body at all and I was like so ecstatic. And um, I sort of came to the next day, I went outside and I was on the street as I'm going down the street a young, maybe like 25 year old woman is walking towards me and the same thing happened. I mean, literally, like I needed the walker, otherwise I would have hit the, hit the sidewalk. Oh. And I always, my whole life, I always wanted to be like, go into a samadhi state and just be completely <laughs> unconscious, completely ecstatic. Yeah, and but once you're in there, it's not that practical. It, well, it's not, and, and I, I, you know, the funny thing is what, you know, what the mind does. Yeah is I was then tried to start protecting myself because the love, it was really the fear of love was so overwhelming mm. for me that um, now when any, another person would start walking down the street, I take the walker, I just direct it right into the traffic in the street to go to the other side because I, I thought that the, uh, they would pick me up and take me to the um, psychiatric hospital and say there's something seriously wrong with this guy. And then it just sort of calmed itself down. But all my books, Feel the Love, are based, are based on that experience. And that this... You didn't freak out more than that? No, no, I didn't freak out. <laughs> I didn't freak out more than that. And I realized that it's always here. It's always shining through our eyes. That awareness is always there every single moment. And we have the ability to touch it. We just I shut it down. Our mind shut it down. Emotionally, we shut it down. Physically, we shut it down. And if we just like let it let ourselves have that experience. So what yeah. is for you the best way to feel that field of love? Well, like I, right now, for example, how well, do you I, start to touch it, feel it? Is it's it just to be it. Yeah, yes, yes. It's, a, it's like uh, Ram Das when he wrote Be Here Now, the last, you know, not his last book, one of the books would Be Love Now. It's just, just be that. It's your true nature. Mm. You know, just, if you can, there's a number of ways you can do it. You can just drop whatever thought you're having just be in, in the moment. Mm. And if you can continuously drop the thought that you're having, you know, even for me, I can just go without, I can just hear the word without, and it just pulls the plug out yeah. of my mind and all of a sudden it's like, what's left? How did that change your relationship, like knowing that and feeling that and being part of that? How did that change your relationship to business or to work and being organized and being creative? I mean, because you used to operate on, on some levels, I yes. guess, at a certain time. Yes. So it, did it take you a, some time to adapt to that and then be organized again? And were you even more clear, clear thinking after it? Well, I think the, the biggest thing that it did for me was that it allowed me to receive yeah. what was out there. It's sort of like, this is myself, a person getting off the elevator, a stranger in the street. This is my own self that's walking towards me. You know, I do meditations now. Um, six days a week at Sarah's uh, meditation center in Sedona. And it's the people that are, when the people walk into the room, it's like, this is me mm. that's walking into the room. Mm. There's no separation. And I just opens myself up and it's like, I would not be, um, 
I wanted to be a yogi. I wanted to be, I moved to Sedona. I wanted to be sitting up on a hillside myself, meditating alone in a cave and go into a transcendental state. And I realized that, you know, the transcendental state is the person that's in front of you, mm. that's walking towards you. And, um, you know, after I had that experience, it wasn't that long, a year later that I ended up, you know, running into uh, Sarah in Byron Katie's living room, mm. you know, in Manhattan Beach. And like, I instantaneously knew. There's a part of me who was wanted to go, whoa, you can't do that. And the, my heart's desire, which is like, so, I was so in touch with, is like, oh yes, you do. You know, and just receiving that, just allowing myself to receive that was like, wow, what a gift. So it's like yeah. moment to moment receiving what's, what's there. So how do you prevent them then to, to, to fall in love with whoever you meet? What? How, how do you not fall in love with whoever you meet then? Well, you do. When you're in you that walk, state. You do fall in love with whomever you meet. Yeah. Yeah. You so know? how do you deal with that? Because you're a man, there is a yeah. woman. Well, it's like if you could see on the levels that it's operating at, it's sort of like the, the self. Okay, the Atman or the soul, whatever you want to call, depending. That thing is just shining bright through you every single moment. And then the first layer that's right outside of it is just a bliss layer. You know, they call that Anandamaya Kosha. You know, it's just bliss. And it shines through into your mind. So when you have an aha moment, see a beautiful sunset, whatever, it's like, whoa. Or you then you hear music, it goes into your emotional, your subtle body, and it's like, You know, you fall in love. That's sort of what you're describing right there. It's like you're falling in love. But it's shining through all levels at all the time. But you don't get, you know, if I start to thinking, oh, this is Lee Lu, okay. You don't they, think they, that's they, what, it's impersonal? No, it's yeah, impersonal. It's, there's, there's no separation. If I started to try to define who you were and what it was, it would be, you know, I would just start creating separation. It's like, I, you know, I just want to go backwards into that uh, bliss layer back into the the awareness that's always shining through every second yeah you know it's like and when yeah. you feel do you ever feel the separation and there are some events that make you that put you in separation or that you put yourself in separation how do you swim back to this well it, of course it, it sort of it arises it comes it goes sometimes it's much more intense than at other times I like one of the chapters that I have in my memoir is called enlightened not And that's a term that, you know, I used to hang around, you know, Byron Katie a lot, and she would go, enlighten not. It's sort of like the mind gets involved, the emotion gets involved, and um, all of a sudden, you're not enlightened, and then the next moment, it's like, you're, you know, totally there. It's like you're, yeah, yeah so it comes and it goes. What an enlightened huh. being, this Byron Katie, huh? <laughs> yeah, you, wonderful, wonderful. Did you stay in touch? No, not that much. After she, she was living right next to us. In, in our house in Sedona, she lived in the house up there, but I, I haven't really, uh, had such a fantastic, loving time with that woman. And uh, she's helped so many people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. There, is there any limit to this spiritual, physical experience here on earth? I mean, how do you see it? What, what are you here for? Um, just to be love. Yeah. Just to be that. <laughs> you know. And I like the I like the terminology because if I were I really should be calling it the unified field of love. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where there's no separation between anything, and that's just sort of the nature of God, 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 love, love, love on a on a very high vibrational level. But if I were to talk in the seeing it title field of love, it's much easier for the mind to like what is he talking about? It's like I want to delve into that, and that's why I named the book title the books field of love as opposed to unified field. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a journey. I mean, you had your journey, and you talk about it inside the, mm. your, your memoir. Yeah. And this was a step-by-step. -step. Were you, would you say that earlier on, when you were in this multi-million dollar businesses, you were not happy? You were, um, and yet you were being successful, so? No, I, I, um, I actually, um, tell the story in the beginning of the book how I had this Kundalini experience unexpectedly yeah. in Gainesville, Florida in 1974. You know, it was like That's four. earlier on. Yeah, yeah, so earlier on. But the thing is that experience was so out of this world. It, it happened over a two, and a two and a half hour period of time that my whole life all I wanted to do was to go back into that um, state. 
in my whole life has been about trying to retouch that space. And I would basically do anything to get there. And the business drugs? said, what, the drugs? What, well, I mean, it's sort of like when it dissipated, it's sort of like I went to doing some, as you were saying before, some mushrooms and anything to try to do it. That can put you in touch with it for six hours or 12 hours or if you're doing LSD, but you want a continuous, uninterrupted experience of it. You have to uh, do a little bit more work, but yeah. And I like what Ramda said when I interviewed him in Maui. He right. said, uh, "When you get the message, hang up the phone." Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> sometimes there are some people that are taking drugs after drugs to get oh, that. Yeah. Whereas you can find that. I, I really feel that deeply inside. We can live that naturally, in yeah. a natural way. Yeah. Well, even in the Yoga Sutras, Pantanjali in the Yoga Sutras, he mentions right in the beginning, it's like one of the ways that you can touch it or have that experience is through drugs. Yeah, you know? but that's not the only way. Well, that's not the only there, way. It's the yeah, final yeah. destination. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, my point as far as the businesses were concerned is sort of, I was just driven to make enough money so that I could meditate. Wow. You know, that's all. That was I, your motive. I, that was my motive. My motive was like, you know, what do I need to do in my life to be able to spend all my time meditating so I could do that? And it's like, you know, I went, I, I did it. I, I retired when I was 40 after taking two companies public. And then when I did that, I built this giant house in Boston that the Saudi royal family actually eventually bought from me because the whole floor was, uh, first floor was this white Carrera marble. It looked like it was wow. right out of Saudi Arabia. But um, when I moved into that house, I had a temple and I would do my own programs. Um, I, uh, I said, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to do a thousand breaths. I am going to force myself into this um, experience. I'm going to force myself into like a Kundalini experience. And all it did was just gave me a giant headache. Can you imagine sitting there for six hours a day and just breathing up into your crown chakra a thousand times a day? You know, I was doing that. And um, that's what I, and so it's so funny to me that uh, in the midst of that, that's when Byron Katie ended up show, walking into my house one day in like the early 90s. Mm. You know, sort of like that was probably the fruit of me doing my breathing. Yeah. You know, she walked in and then it's like, well, how do I go even beyond this? And then it's like, okay, we're going to blow up your back and put you into this other transcendental state. So there are so many different ways. Yes. There are so many different ways to reach, could we say, enlightenment or awakening? Well, I mean, no, to, to, well, to touch it, it's always there. The main thing, the main thing that I like to say, it's always there every single, every moment. Yeah. And um, we disconnect. From yeah, it this now. book, this book, this second book that I wrote, which actually I have, you know, I put on Amazon. It's ebook free all the time, so people can see. It. And I think there's seven different ways that I say. This you know, is a free ebook on oh, Amazon. Oh yeah, yeah, oh, nice. yeah, all the. Yeah, all the time. So people can want to read some Thank of those. Thank you like, for doing that, oh. Marnie. <laughs> Free. <laughs> um, I talk about different ways. And it's, I say just meet yourself where you are. If you're doing hatha yoga, there's so many people that do hatha yoga, meditate for five minutes. If you're meditating, you know, 45 minutes a day and you want to do, you know, start doing some kundalini yoga. You know, start doing more intense, you know, breathing exercises. If you're, you know, really want to, get super serious, go find a guru and surrender to somebody who's going to tell you what to do, you know, when you might not want to do it. Um, on and on, do inquiry. You know, it's some of the things, it gets more and more complicated as it goes along, but from my experience, everything is uh, movement. It's all predestined. Is there a destiny? It's already yeah, written? It's, all, it's, already, it's already written. Yeah. And because of that, the thing that I say to people all the time when they come and meditate with me is that the number one thing I suggest is to be kind and loving to yourself. Yeah. It's like honor yourself, worship yourself. There's nobody on this planet who deserves your love more than you, that deserves love more than you. So you have, if this thing is just unfolding like that, how could you just not love it? Just, I'm going to sit back and, you know, see what happens next. All you can do is just move your attention. Yeah. Just do the, just do a little bit more, even if it's two minutes. Even just do a little bit more. 
just do a little bit how more. How do you That's know all. it's efficient? I mean, how do you know? Why, why do you choose some techniques versus some others? Because it will I just think come some to people you. Don't know. Yeah, but they'll, we they'll, don't they... know what you choose. There's so many things. There's so many different uh, movements. They, you know what? To, intuitively, you know what to choose. Intuitive. You just sit there. You know you, your heart's desires. You know what your. It already knows. It's in you. It's it's who you are. You know. It will lead it you. Good. It feels good. It feels good. It will lead you what to do, and you might do whatever that practice is for five minutes, or you might do it for five years. So and every idea that you would have, you would sit down and just see. Well, it from not your me. Heart. I mean, not for me. It's like I. Would, would you take your time, or the well, intuition yeah, I, just comes in? Just well, like I mean, I ended up having that experience. I went and lived with uh, Muktananda, you know, for a number of years. I ran an ashram of his in Boston. You know, I was like. Totally, you know, that took up a really You're big part. a real po devotee. Yeah, that took up a big part of my life. Yeah. You know, and then he died in 1982, and it's like, okay, what do I do now? It's like, well, I have two young children. It's like, I need to make some money, and I really want to meditate, so how do I do that? I just listened intuitively. I just listened. You know, I think a good example is my paintings, because you know I never painted before. Yeah, and that's people, extraordinary. And people are like, well, how did you do that? It's like, I did the companies the same way that I painted. I just listened. It's like, what do I do next? I just, I'm, a, I was just, I'm just a good listener because I have great faith in that that source, which is always lit up inside of me, is is always there, is going to give me give me the answer, you know. So how do you listen? Tell us more about that. Oh, you just get you just get what very. What is your ritual or to <clears throat> listen? What is what is the best moment during the day or way for you to listen to that? Um, how do you get there? Well, I, my mind is very quiet and very still most of the time. Yeah. You know, so I notice when something starts to activate or I'm having thoughts about something, it's, it captures my attention. Then I start to, if I need to take an action about something, you know, like the only thing I'm listening these days is sort of, you know, I was meditating uh, six days a week, running meditation six days a week. Now I'm going to be doing it nine times a week, like four days a week is going to be twice a day. And... It's like, why am I doing that? Well, the main reason to do anything is because it feels really good, mm -hmm. you know? And I always say that too, it's like, don't do any of these practices and things unless it, you're getting something from it, unless it feels good. People, people know this, when they do Hatha Yoga, all right, they come out of that thing and they go, this feels good, I'm going back tomorrow. I'm going three days a week. Or they meditate, it's like, that felt good. 15 minutes, I'm gonna meditate. Can you so, do too much of a thing that feels good? Well, it doesn't matter, even if you do too, yeah, you can definitely do too much of a thing, and your body will immediately let you know. Mm -hmm. Your mind, your being will let you know, okay, that's too much, okay, let's settle down here. And I think in my memoir, which you, you see, is that I went through such a range of experiences that were so diverse, mm. so many of them so crazy. I mean, even if you looked on Amazon, some of the comments, it's like, this guy's, you know, some of the things that I revealed, which my uh, wife and daughter said, you're out of your mind, this is coming out of the book. And Why they, did you want to put all this out? Well, I, when I wrote the book, mm -hmm. I just heard the only way to do it, because I wrote a one, 45 minutes a day, you know, 150 days, and there's 150 chapters roughly in the book, and the only way I could do was not to censor myself at all. I just wrote it. Authentically. As, authentically, as if I was back there reliving the experience, you know. Well, like yeah, you know whether I was taking over a building at Cornell, I did when I was in college, or if I was uh, in a house of prostitution in the Far East, you know, that's all in there. And the whole story, it's like, wow. it's, and I look at it now because I wrote it five years ago. It's like, is some of this stuff? Uh, you could see that some of the chapter titles are funny. It's like, yeah. is, there, is this necessary? But I think that's what happens. It's, it's all movement. For, everybody's going through their own story. Yeah. So this creates the space, especially, I found especially for men, have reacted much more um, to the book because, wow, it's like I just love how free you are mm. just writing all this stuff. It's like you didn't hold any of it down. You didn't suppress anything, mm. you know, and it just creates freedom for people to yeah. go, okay, wherever I am is where I'm supposed to be. I think it's very, you just had the Wayne Dyer's voice there. Oh, my God, I just freaked out. <laughs> Uh, it's great for women and men to, well, well let me t say this, would you consider yourself as a man of the heart, a man with an open heart? 
Yeah, I would consider my. Yeah. Well, I think your sent the core being even from like a quantum physics standpoint. Yeah. Because from a yogic standpoint, for me, for so many years, probably 25 years of my life, I was always trying to the crown chakra or trying to blow out the top of my head, which I had, had done in the past, seemed to be where the center was. But after that field of love experience in the hallway, everything ended up being more in the center part of my being. Not the physical heart, or not e it's not even the heart chakra. Yeah. It's just the center of your being. So if you want to refer to that as the heart, okay, that's what I like to refer to as yeah. the heart or your center. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I think yeah. it's great to see that because you seem to have a feminine and a masculine energy quite balanced there. Do you, are you in touch with that feminine and masculine side within you? Do you feel it balanced? Um, yeah, I don't really relate to. Uh, I know that my feminine side is very sort of like, say, the left handed path, the right handed path, so the left handed side. Um, I naturally, which I notice for myself, which is that when I breathe, I usually breathe in my left nostril, okay? Which even from the left-hand side, the feminine side, actually activates your right brain, okay? You're breathing your left, your left nostrils, that you, sort of that spatial, um, non-verbal side of you, like Jill Bolte-Taylor goes into um, in her experience when she had her stroke, her, you know, Left hand side. TEDx of, yeah, 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 right. Ted, sorry, her left side of the brain shut down. Her whole right side was just then mm. lit up and operating. Mm -hmm. So that's the feminine side. So the whole creative side is like the right side of your brain. But when you're actually breathing, you're breathing, your left nostril will activate your right side of your brain. So mm. I s experience myself. Um, and because of that, as my wife loves to say to me all the time, it's like you're linguistically challenged <laughs> because. You know, I'm not very good with words. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I would disagree with that. But anyway, uh, we have to talk about your this relationship and how you've attracted that in your life and what mm -hmm. kind of maybe recommendation you have for someone that wants to attract this kind of love. Mm -hmm. What kind of love? How would you label it? Um, Is it a soulmate love? Is it a twin flame love? <laughs> Is it just pure love, <laughs> divine love? <laughs> Well, I um, I tell the story I tell the story of the, in the book and of how I met Sarah and I was like uh, sitting in Katie's living room in Manhattan Beach and this girl was three days in a row as I looked out the window this girl was walking down and I was like I was like wow I was happy being in California because I was had been living in Sedona <laughs> and uh, in your uh, cave in my cave <laughs> and out of nowhere. Um, this guy who actually staying in the house walked up and started talking to her. I was like, I was like, Shh, you can't be talking to that girl out there. It's like that's the girl I've been looking at the last three <laughs> days. I, I felt like he walked into the house and I said, you know, how did you do that? And he goes, oh, that's Sarah. She worked for Katie. I knew right at that moment I wasn't going to have to uh, do anything. And sure enough, she walked up and she sat like close. She sat right in front of me, and um, as she was sitting there in front of me, I, I maybe 15 seconds, you know, I could just feel inside of me, you know, this such a desire of wanting, like a l child seeing a red fire truck for, you know, for the first time, <laughs> right? Like, I want that. I had a deadpan face. I didn't show that at all, mm -hmm. but I could just feel it just rise up inside of me with such intensity. And uh, I had no expectation. More than a desire, more than well, a physical well, desire. Yeah, yeah. It was I, in there, but. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't physical. It was. It was like I was seeing myself. It was like the, my heart. Yeah. I would say in this case, the heart chakra all of a sudden just like opened up, Ooh. and it, it, just, it just wanted to. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to. Uh, sur you know, just wanted her. Yeah. I, I just. I just wanted her. Wow. So, and I had no expectations whatsoever of that. But because of that other experience that I had with uh, my operation, yeah. I was now without the thought that I'm not lovable. It's like I can be loved. I can receive. Yeah. You know, I don't have to shut down the young girl that's walking down the street, yeah. you know, going like, I better cross the street. I don't care if the car's going to hit me. I'm just going to embrace it. So it was sort of like a physical manifestation of love in front of me, okay, just coming right at me. And it's like, whoa. You know, I'm going to receive it. I'm not going to, you know, yeah. I'm not going to stop this. So there was no preconceived plan on my part. You Never can say, pushed it. 
Never, well, no, I didn't push it. Never pursued it. Never, yeah. And you, you know, there's, I have a numerous stories in the book about other relationships that I were in. Yeah. Some of them were quite, very, very entertaining, uh -huh. you know? Dysfunctional? And, yeah, oh, think? totally dysfunctional. I mean, fist fights, like, oh, oh, I have the whole thing described, you <sighs> oh, know? Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to, like, say, um, it's going to look this way and this is what you do and you meditate. No. And all of a sudden, it's, no, no, it's like, you know. No, no, this is your story. Yeah, this is my story. It's like, yeah. however it looks, yeah. it, it looks, and it, it looks crazy. Sometimes it looks crazy, but that's why I like, always say you have to, like, love yourself and allow yourself to go through whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and then when you start to, uh, when you're loving yourself more and more as time passes by and your destiny goes and you're having all the experiences you're supposed to have, you have, Whoever that person's going to be there for you, shows there, up. it shows up. Yes. You don't really have to do anything. Sometimes I see that we have this destiny that is written. That, that's yeah. how actually I see yeah. it. Like we have their destiny, and then we take sidewalks and we kind of navigate, and we have other kind of experiences. Yeah. When really this is the ultimate, this is the ultimate, ultimate destiny. It's already written. Yeah. Like there is the best scenario possible, and then we go and wind around, and we have to to experience other things. But couldn't, when we could truly live through love and, and be that. Yeah. And well, the only thing I would say is all those other little side things, those things are part of that too. This, they're part of, of that. that too. Yeah, they're okay. part of that but too. They feel sometimes we have different options, right? Well, in the moment, it looks like we have different options. Yeah. But if I go look backwards at everything that's unfolded in my life, and I, yeah. if I ask this to people, it's like, well, everything that's happened to you, what do you think? You think it would, could have happened any differently? They go, no, I think it's like absolutely perfect. Yes. So that's telling you something yeah. right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. You must have seen it doing this exercise of retracing. Like, oh, oh, yeah, I could see it. Yeah, and yeah. And yeah. seeing the synchronicities and right. this moment where there was a turning point. Yeah, or even even what you would call in the moment, it seemed to be like a horrible relationship or something terrible that's happening, or somebody died, or somebody got in an accident. Then you step back from it and look three years later and go, "Wow, something really amazing came out of that, you know, that moment, wow. that experience." So it's. Um, and just, I think it just gives you the confidence to allow yourself to open up and love yourself, you know, and love everyone else around you seeing, you know, just let it, just let it happen. Yeah. You yeah. never had to do some forgiveness work or to look back at your past and just work things out to, the main work was with, with yourself, with yeah, yourself? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. I, uh, forgiveness is like, um... You know, I get in trouble when I start talking about forgiveness because I think forgiveness is um, such a duality supporter. You know, mm. who are you forgiving, who for what? It's all me. Yeah. It's all me, right. me over there yes. all the time. Yeah. So I, if I'm going to forget, forgive, it's like forgiving me for basically having wrong understanding or not seeing things clearly, uh -huh. you know, especially myself, you know. But even I say somebody, whatever anybody has ever done to you, yeah. okay, or you have done to yourself, you know, just... Both to, you have allowed it. You both have allowed it. So yeah. you just like, thank you, thank you yeah. for, for, for giving me that experience. Do you believe in reincarnation? Yes. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you have a feeling you chose, like all the people in your life right now, there's been an agreement that's been done before and you might have known them in another lifetime? Um... I think some of the people are, but I think my experience also is that a lot of the a lot of them there are sort of characters. It's like this world is a giant computer, and mm -hmm. there's six billion people on it right now, and everybody's inputting, you know, their vision board. Okay, they're all putting in their heart's desires, whatever they want to manifest. But how can everybody manifest something if there's six billion? So it's this whole thing. Everything is going in, and the giant computer basically just. God gets all the information and it just starts to manifest as it goes out. But since there's so much information going in at every single moment, what you want to happen with you is not going to happen tomorrow or the next day. It might happen in six months. It might happen in a year. It might happen 20 years. It might happen in your next lifetime. But I can guarantee one thing. Whatever you want, you will get. It doesn't have a choice. The universe will give you, source will give you everything you ever want. It doesn't have a choice. As long as it's a hard desire? Well, as long well, as it's well, authentic? It's a, no, it doesn't even have to be a, a authentic. How about if somebody's dreaming to have an Aston Martin? You right, know? you will have it. 
you will have it. Give me some time and it will happen. I'm just like, I'm not saying it's like, uh, I'm going to laugh. I bet you like 20 years from now, they asked him, Martin, it's going to be there. You know, it's like whoever's, who's ever thought that that is, you know. Yeah. So it's so. It, how is that related to reincarnation and the soul? That well, the only thing reason saying that is because whatever some of the latent, what they would call them, samskaras left over, which are stored in your quote unquote causal body that goes with you, like your soul from one lifetime to the next, it has those impressions. It knows what the desire is that you want. So if it doesn't get manifested in this lifetime, it's going to get manifested in the next lifetime or the lifetime after that. What do you think you are here to manifest? Um, I'm just here to manifest being love, yeah. you know, and to totally owning that and allowing myself to receive it to the fullest extent, you know, and part of my... To the fullest uh, extent. To the fullest yes. extent, my, my emotional or my mind will try to get control sometimes and shut that down because it's sort of like... Um, if love, total love, total, just total receiving, unconditional of my own self and everything else around me is like, whoa, that's like a lot. It's I mean, a lot. It's a lot. I mean... Um, Do you it, still see the, your own limitations? Well, I, I, totally. I mean, I see them function. Them? I see them function, but yeah. it's like even enlightened beings. You see, you think that an enlightened being is sitting there in some... Uh, state that's very different than my state or your state. There are 150 billion neurons that are in their brains that are operating. Their breath is going in and out. They're they're having thoughts. They're having feelings. Even a saint will see a child or see something that emotionally will affect them, which would, could make them cry, or they could get angry and slap somebody. Even somebody as like transcendent as Ramana Maharshi. You know, he'll tell stories like getting pissed off at like a kid or something for do something and like out of nowhere, whack. Yeah, you know? there's a lot of stories. Around yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, 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 you know, hitting somebody. It's like, whoa, why would he do that? You yeah. know, it's like, and all these Satan's and sages through the ears. Are, everything is operating. So they're so human on so many levels. But there's this awareness that's, you know, sitting back yeah. and shining through them of love. It's almost like this you know, wave of love that they're experiencing every single moment, even though their bodies are doing these other things, which, quote, unquote, you know, people go, wow, I wonder why they're doing that, mm -hmm. you know? But their internal experience is very, you know, it's like a straight hour that's always in touch with that. There seems to be some people that are going after getting the answer or the knowledge from one person after the next and ultimately they're never connecting to the, who they are. Yeah. So whatever goes wrong, they can blame it for one person and to the next, but they never fully experience themselves. Yeah. What would you say? Because I would it just seems like, to be some people are getting lost. Oh, yeah, well, I say keep on doing that until you don't. You know what? Eventually that's going to exhaust you. Yeah. Eventually that's going to exhaust you and you're going to say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to stay. I have enough faith in this person. I'm going to hang out with them. I'm going to stay with them until I don't. You know, until, you know, I'm going to get as much as I could possibly get. But the people who go from one to the next, they'll keep on going like that yeah. from one to the next until they don't. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fine. Because ultimately it's here. Oh, ultimately it's, it's, always it's always there. It's always there. It's always there. And that's all perfect. There's nothing but perfection happening. So even they're just going from this to that, it's sort of like, you know, I have people come in and sit and meditate with me. It's like they're there and they go. They're gone for six months. They come back. They sit there and meditate. It's like... Yeah. That, that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing. How do I know that's what's happening? Yeah. You know, it's like the, you know, reality doesn't lie. This is nothing but God, God, God doing his or her thing over and over. Mm. You are one of the teachers now, meditation teacher, also at the Chopra Center, right? Well, I'm, yeah, You're I am. You're going yeah, there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going there uh, tomorrow because they have an event called Spiritual Solutions. Yeah, so this and is going to air later, but uh, do you often, like, do you start to do retreats now? And well, no, I, places, I, I, I find that for myself, what I'm most comfortable with is to just sit silently and meditate with people. And if somebody happens to ask me a question, they do. Most of the times, they don't. And um, the reason I'm going to the Chopra Center and doing this event is because the people who make those decisions at the Chopra Center have heard me tell a number of stories, okay, especially in regards to relationship. 
So it's sort of like I don't really have to give a presentation other mm. than go and tell a couple of stories and entertain. Would you like to have your own ashram? <laughs> Well, I did actually. I mean, oh no, I'm not no, joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I did. I did at one time, and that, that's a lot of work. I mean, anybody who puts themselves or ends up in the role of being a teacher or whatever, there's so much. Um, and being worshipped. Yeah, and being what, what, however they're looked at. You know, there's a tremendous amount of um, pressure on that, and yeah. you know, my 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 heroes from my. From my experience, are Ramana Maharshi mm. and uh, Nichananda, who was uh, Muktananda's guru, mm. and he, you know, he just sat there, and for the most part, the way Muktananda likes to describe it, he just like, uh, he just grunted, you know, he, he didn't <laughs> say anything, he didn't teach anything, he didn't say anything to anybody. He was just pure being, and Ramana, for the most part, you know, you know all so many of his discourses with conversations with people have there are records of those. And um, you know, he was just continuously saying people over to people over and over again when they ask him a question. It's like, from where did that thought arise? Mm. You know, who had that thought? Mm. You know, people want to know about this. They want to know different worlds. They want to know about going into a samadhi state. You know, they want to know if where is the soul? You know, what's going to happen? He would say, from where did that thought arise? Because he knows his experiences, so that that self that you really want is right there at this moment mm -hmm. asking the question. It's, just, it's who you are. It's like, forget about that. Find that source. And when you find that source, it's like, you know, wow, does that feel good, you know? And do it uninterruptedly, you know? Do it uninterruptedly, so. Thank you, Marty. You're welcome. Thank you so much ah. for this beautiful interview. Oh, it's thank been you for having me. I'm pleasure. so happy that you're here in Sedona <laughs> again. Yeah. Really, really. I'll be Great. back a couple of times this year. This is a beautiful state, yeah. beautiful city, actually. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it feels like it's a country of its own. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Marty. Thank you. Thank and you. I wish you amazing meditation. Oh, and thank you. Be in the flow. Okay. And, uh, delicious co creators, we send you so much love. I mean, you are love. They are yes. love. We are love. Yes. So just be with yourself, enjoying that love. <laughs> thank you. Much, much love. Bye. Mm -hmm.